Today on Multiverse News, the Flash trailer dropped among a many other movies announced from Warner Brothers uh, at CinemaCon. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the Jonathan Majors debacle that's been happening. Uh, there's a series in the works for Twilight. Do you guys care? Do we care? You'll find out. Uh, plus, possible Reed Richards casting. All that right after this. Welcome to Multiverse News, your source for information about all your favorite fictional universes. Uh, CinemaCon is happening while we record this, so uh, if we miss anything, it's because that's happening right now. But we're going to do our best. Around the horn, we have Haley Hobbs over here from Source Pages. How you doing, Haley Hobbs? I'm great. Hello, world. Hello, hello. Jay Sisson of Commute the Podcast down here. How you doing, Jay? I'm doing well. Glad to be here. Sweet, sweet. And Jay Scotty St. Clair of Animation Deliberation. What's happening, my friend? Happy to be here, hoping that this show gets popular enough that maybe one day I can attend CinemaCon. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. That's a good fingers crossed. With a badge, too, like an official yes. press badge. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we got a lot of news, so let's, let's get to it. Let's get to it. Over at CinemaCon, today Warner Brothers held a lengthy presentation uh, during which footage was shown from several upcoming films, including Barbie, Dune 2, Joker 2, Aquaman 2, Furiosa, otherwise known as Mad Max 2, and uh, <laughs> The Flash, uh, Wonka, The Meg 2, Beetlejuice 2, The Nun 2, and others. Uh, a full trailer was shown for The Flash, which is now online, with WB set to release a long list of films over the next couple of years. Which ones are we most looking forward to? There's a lot of good ones in there. There's a lot of questionable ones in there. I know I'm looking forward to Dune Part 2. Really looking forward to Barbie now. It looks super fun. And always with trepidation, looking forward to DC's entries to the film verse. So they've got a lot of stuff cooking. It looks like they're really trying to stretch their tentacles into different genres and not really pin themselves down as any one thing. No, that's for sure. And they're, except for the one thing being number twos. They really, <laughs> it just, it's just so funny because it's not like a lot of sequels. It's all number twos. It's so funny to me. I had to look up what the Meg 2 was. Like, I was like, what is the Meg? And I started looking into it. It's, it's that movie with Jason Statham where he gets attacked by a giant prehistoric shark. And I was like, yeah, definitely, man. we need another one of these. Of course. Absolutely. Why not? Absolutely. Absolutely. I feel like you're being sarcastic, but I don't understand. <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to make mention about the fact that Barbie is the only film on this list that is not a prequel or a sequel, so it kind of stands out there. I'm excited to see Greta Gerwig's third outing, and I'm actually surprised about how excited for Barbie I am. I heard reports coming out of Cine CinemaCon that it's made for people that hate Barbie and people that love Barbie, so that sounds <laughs> really interesting and sounds like it's going to be for everybody ultimately, uh, but I'm with you, Haley. Dune 2 is definitely one of the ones I'm most excited for. Um, I love that first film. It kind of like recaptured a feeling like we talked about Lord of the Rings on this sh show before, but it definitely took me back to that place. I read the novel before that first film came out and it's just so epic and so sweeping and the world building is, is spectacular. I'm excited to return to that world, but I, I do think we should talk about the flash Taylor trailer rather. So right. You guys are burying the lead like crazy. What do you think of the flash trailer? <laughs> I am so fascinated by The Flash and the marketing for this movie is kind of crazy. It's great. Like the the all of the controversy, all of the lead up, all of the connections to the past and all these movies don't matter and we're rebooting a new universe. Like people are going to go see this movie. Mm -hmm. uh, this this trailer was excellent. It was so interesting. It makes the movie look interesting and I'm I'm just going to be really interested in the box office of all this because we've seen that the older DC movies, uh, well, we've seen Shazam at least, uh, be an example that that is kind of a curse to be attached to the old DC. But I think this one will be different for a lot of reasons. Um, it's in June. It's going to be, I think the only movie it'll be up against when it premieres is that Pixar movie Elemental. But I think and it'll Spider -verse, be... Spider-Verse, I think. Oh, okay. Ooh, yeah, it, so it's right in that area. Yeah, I clash. think it'll... It'll be the movie to see for at least one weekend. 
you know, which <laughs> which has a lot of value. Uh, but sure. um, I'm just, it's going to be a fascinating case in the box office just to see, like, mm-hmm. does it outperform expectations? Does it underperform expectations? And uh, kind of where does where does DC go from here with the Flash? How much is it connected to the new, and how much is it connected to the old? Well, the thing is, like, you're talking about being connected to the old DC and that being a curse, but the real benefit here is it's connected to the older DC. Yes, which is, absolutely. I mean, like, that's going to bring in so many people who could not care about Batfleck. Like, so many people that, like, this is not their Batman anymore, This that have left DC, but that grew up on Michael Keaton as Batman. Like, myself, I am, like, I, there's a lot of controversy around this movie. I think it's, it's probable that we won't be... Uh, um, having this flash much longer in the, in this universe if things keep continuing or, you know, we'll, we'll maybe learn more or whatever, but like the f- freaking Michael Keaton's coming back, man. <laughs> like how, <laughs> you know, that's as big a deal to me as the Spider-Man triple crossover. Like this is huge. And, uh, I'm just so excited for it. I can't. And like, we, we talked a little bit before the show. Uh, I should let you guys talk about it first. I'm going to go nuts. Uh, let's go nuts. What did you guys think of that? <laughs> I'm so ready to get nuts with Michael Keaton because that's my favorite line from that movie and he delivers it so crazily. And it's super different in this trailer, obviously. It's wink, wink, nod, nod to all of us who totally love him as Batman. And mm-hmm. I'm okay with that personally. I hated it. I hated ah! it so much. Yeah, I knew you loved it. I wanted you to give your chance to say it first. I, I lo- loved it. I love the reference to that line. But like... He's referencing a moment when he was pretending to be a different person. You know what I mean? Like, it's a moment where the Joker's doing a thing and he's like, you want to get nuts? Let's get nuts. Like, as <laughs> Bruce Wayne, like, it's 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 almost too meta. It's like he's mm-hmm. referencing a famous moment from a movie he was in instead of, like, something that this Bruce Wayne would be thinking of at this moment. I don't know. It just feels it feels a little too cute for me. It could be the most wink, wink, nod, nod line of all time. Right. Like, by the time it's done. And, uh, you know, it's so ridiculous that I'm in on it. Like, if it was <laughs> just, like, a little yeah, bit Jay. less ridiculous, I'd be like, I hate it. But since it's <laughs> so ridiculous, it's, like, crossed into funny that how ridiculous it is yeah and so you know i'm in that's uh, fair let's let's just go let's just go full on you know let's just go for it (laughs) (laughs) the absurdity and the self-referential nature of the line is not what bothers me what bothers me is i would have liked to experience that moment in the theater rather than in the trailer like i love the trailer i love the homage to both batman and how they have something to teach barry in terms of like their losses or what shaped them and made them the heroes that they are so I, I loved everything about the trailer except for having that line spoiled. Like I felt like I feel like movies and studios have gotten so much better about their trailers not spoiling everything, but that just that was one of those moments I know it would have been like it's going it's still gonna get applause in the theater, but it would have landed so much better for me had I experienced it firsthand in the theater. Mm, that is fair. That is fair. All right. Well, it sounds like we're all pretty excited about that. Uh let's move on to our next story. Uh The Jonathan Majors debacle continues to worsen as the actor's May 8th court appearance approaches. In addition to being dropped by his publicists and management firm, there have been reports of multiple alleged abuse victims coming forth to cooperate with the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Although Majors' attorneys maintain his innocence, an eventual inevitable exoneration is the bad publicity and tarnished reputation enough for Marvel Studios to sever ties with him as well? With Kang seemingly being the focus of the MCU's upcoming phases, how likely is it that contingency plans will see the villain recast or scrapped altogether? I think it's extremely likely, if not inevitable at this point, based on just kind of how this story has unfolded. Uh, You know, we just got done talking about Ezra Miller and The Flash, and Mm. there's a little bit of common DNA here uh, in some ways. And I think you kind of have to look at this and say, is this like the Ezra Miller situation where 
you've invested so much that you have to keep on rolling with this person despite all of it and whether all the PR storms every time they're in a show or a movie. Because if that's the case with majors, you're talking every premiere, every press tour, this will hang like a cloud over it if it's not resolved in a very definitive way in court mm. if Marvel decides to march on with majors. And the best example of that is Loki because at this mm. moment, we know nothing about that show. And I, I think it's probably a pretty much 100% guarantee that this is why we haven't seen the trailer for that yet is because Jonathan Majors is all over that trailer, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. And I mean, now they've recasted before, so that's not unprecedented for Marvel to do. Uh, but what makes this different is that there's such a wide ranging future that Marvel has mapped out here under majors and this character that they've already introduced, you know, financially for the Ezra Miller situation, it doesn't really make sense to recast him because the move is movie is done, but also you can cut ties with the whole franchise that's been built around, you know, that particular version of the character after this movie releases. But with majors, you're, you're talking about, you know, you can't control the story with just always oh, getting help. And, you know, we're just kind of working through it together. Like DC is going to have to do for the next month or so, uh, you know, and unfortunately these moves are just kind of always based around the, the scale of cost effectiveness, right? Mm -hmm. Like someone at Marvel is going to take out the scales and they're going to weigh and they're going to decide the financial cost of recasting him and the financial cost of keeping him. And they're going to weigh those two things and then they're going to decide which one's heavier. And that's going to determine kind of what's going to, what's going to happen with this. If it's easier to work around it or if it's easier to just cut ties and start over. And I think at this point, at least on this podcast, you know, we can't, bring an answer to that because we don't know what's happened behind the scenes legally. We also don't know what's happened behind the scenes at Marvel in terms of like, you have to think of all kinds of little stuff. Like, have they already made the VFX models for him? Have they already done, you know, all that type of stuff matters. Uh, and so a lot of that's going to boil down to just, and, and I say, unfortunately, because you think about like the idea of just like doing the greater good or whatever, like, unfortunately, mm. when you're talking about these types of things, that's not really the focus. Uh, the focus with these things does come down to dollars and cents uh, ultimately. And, and I think, mm kind of right now, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing this weighing of scales going on. Hmm. Yeah, I'm glad you both already kind of made the Ezra Miller comparisons because I think it's super appropriate. And thinking about Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, um, a lot of people had thoughts and opinions on that film. I liked it, but I know a lot of opinions were that Jonathan Major's performance was the one saving grace of that film. So it's really just a shame and it doesn't seem like Marvel can catch a break here. But, you know, I think Jay was very eloquent and succinct in his dissection of the situation there. And I, I don't know if I can add any more value on that end. But from a creative standpoint, we're dealing with the multiverse here. Even if they do decide to go forward with, you know, the Kang dynasty, I think things are a little too far set in motion to completely pivot from that, that story arc that they seem to be pursuing. The multiverse is the perfect backdrop. We've already seen, you know, recasting like Jay brought up, but also... When variants exist, we've seen multiple versions of Spider-Man. We've seen multiple versions of Loki. Uh, I think Doctor Strange and Kang might be the exceptions where their multiversal selves seem to be the same actor going forward. But I, I think it's early enough in the game that they can recast. And I think most people would still be on board given the situation. Mm. Jay, you said the word unfortunate and you kind of like, we're like, well, well let, me, let me clarify, not unfortunate, you know, uh, but I think it like for yeah. artistic purposes, it's very unfortunate. Um, yeah. It's very sad because this isn't only like a continuity issue for me where I'm like, no, they've already introduced Kangs. They've shown us hundreds and hundreds of Kangs. It's like Jonathan Majors was so good in the role. He's mm. so, so good in what they've done so far. And I am like a hundred percent on board. Uh, with scrapping him if that's what needs to happen if that's what the evidence shows and it needs like and it's looking that way um but it is still really sad from an artistic perspective like looking at it just being like man that was the last episode of loki is something that i find just incredible and it's all about him it's the only show i've ever seen where they completely bring someone new in in the last episode, focus almost solely on that character, almost like to, to the detriment, like, you know, I'm so focused on L Kang in that last episode that, that I'm not doing my normal thing, which is like, 
oh, they brought someone in the last episode and it like took just took away from the story they were telling because it's so compelling. He is so compelling that he overcomes that, you know. Um, and I and I just it's a real bummer artistically and uh, as a fan, but you know, uh, obviously the the right thing to do is the right thing to do, uh, and hopefully that will be very clear once this court once we, hopefully after May eighth we'll see some real evidence or something will come out that will make it a little more clear because right now uh it looks pretty bad um we'll just we'll see what kind of things they have yeah i don't have a lot to add um it does have to be definitive but already you've got a fan base that's going we don't want him if this is true and so oh yeah for all the reasons you guys have said i don't need to repeat everything you've said and we'll see what happens the length of this being drawn out is super interesting to me and Marvel's met with him or his people, so they know something. Um, but what do they know? We'll find out. Indeed. And if you recast him, you don't even really need to explain it. Like, you know, I mean, True. we already know what's going on. Everybody's aware. You know, I think, I don't think you need to come in with a, oh, his, somebody moved a thing and it made his face different or what. Like, you just, just throw a person in there and just roll. And, um, you know, there was a stadium full of him at the end of Ant Man and the yeah. Wasp Quantumania, which, you know, it is what it is. Like, yep. if you have, if you got to recast him, you got to recast him. It is what it is. I was, uh, I forget what show we were on, or or it was the Zoom call with the patrons on MCU Cast the night. I'm not really sure, but I was saying like one way they could handle this is just refilming that one scene from Quantum Mania. <laughs> if they just change that on Disney Plus, if if, if this all needs to happen. That is one way they could do it. Refilm that one scene and make all those variants different, including the three that they introduced, like Amortis and the... If they made those three all different characters, then we could have a completely different version of Kang the con- like that is a multitude of actors. Bring in all kinds of actors. Get amazing actors that we all love and refilm that one scene and release it out on Disney Plus when they release Quantumania. It would cover over all of it, and we'd have like, okay, maybe they, maybe Jonathan Majors has a small role going forward where he comes in to finish off whatever Kang the Conqueror is doing or something, but he's not like the focus of the entire phases, you know? He's not the linchpin, or or you just recast that one version of Kang, you know? Uh, I don't know. Anyway, uh, let's 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 try to move on. Let's try to move on. It's just such an awkward story to talk about. Nothing uh, to see here. Nothing to see here. <laughs> well, I, I fully don't want to do that. But yeah, I also I'm don't joking. want – it's, it's like until there's real strong facts come out, it's, it's just always like we're either – however we talk about it feels like we're talking about it in a way that's dismissive or it's uh, over like crucifying him. You know what I mean? Like it's like sure. you don't want to go either way with it. So you just want to like wait till the facts come out. Wait till the facts come out. But it's such a big story we can't help it. Talk about it sure. some. Nah. Okay. Up next – Coming hot off the heels of the announced Harry Potter TV series reboot, uh, we have news that Lionsgate is following suit and developing a Twilight saga for a similar television treatment. This comes to us at the same time as reports of a Magnificent Seven series and a Galaxy Quest series. How do we feel about this emerging trend of adapting existing IP for the smaller screen, and how do we feel about a Twilight series? Yeah, I drew the short straw on this one. Uh, I, I I just I just uh, you know if if you are a fan of Twilight, I am happy for you. I'm happy that those books exist. I'm happy that those films exist. I'm happy that there's a new reimagining in the works for you. But um, I, I can't really speak to Twilight that much. I watched the first one. I gave the second one a chance because I was like, hey, there'll be werewolves, you know. But <laughs> Team Edward, Team Jacob, I'm just I'm just Team J. Scotty, like you know, on this one. <laughs> uh, oh, you liked Bella that much. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, so you're saying there's a shot. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, no, I do want to speak to this trend because it, it definitely seems like the popular thing to do right now. Like, oh, you get a TV series, you get a TV series, you get a TV series. Like, this is what's popular right now, so let's do it. And I do think it speaks to some creative bankruptcy. I think, um, like, Hearing all of these these things in the works, like I'm actually more excited for the Magnificent Seven and the Galaxy Quest um, series because I feel like those are properties that have haven't been mined as fully. So there's actually an opportunity to spend more time in those worlds and actually have something fresh. Whereas the other ones feel like, 
a rehash, um, you know, thinking about ever since we got that Lord of the Rings, um, Rings of Power, which I have not seen it's in, in its entirety, but this seems to be the trend going forward, even with John Wick and the Continental series going on. Like, I'm excited for that, but I would just like to see, you know, the creation of new in intellectual property instead of like always going back to the same tried and true properties and, and formulas. So that's my take on it. Interesting. I I agree with you. I think that's a, there's a there's a problem going back to the same thing. But I was thinking of it from the other perspective of like, if you're going to continue making these series, why do you make them a series or a movie? And I was thinking about why why they keep making that decision. And I think it's mm -hmm. because we're in this age of TV where TV's just more respected than movies, and in a lot of like sure. by fans, like a, a, a movie is a two hour like gamble. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like a, a series is almost always positive because what happens is if you don't like it, it tends to just like the people who don't like it, stop watching it. You know what I mean? Like if sure. you go to the theater, you've seen the whole thing and you have a fully fleshed out opinion. If you watch a show and you, you the first episode, you're like, eh, then you're just the guy who says <laughs> that whenever it comes up. But if you're a follower of it, you watch the whole thing and you're like, it's amazing. You know, like you get, mm. there's a sense of investment. There's a sense of week to week discussion, water cooler stuff. Like there's just all this reason that series have like a stronger chance in the marketplace or something. And I, I, I that's all just speculation, but the truth is just, there've been much more critical acclaim for series lately. Um, and movies are almost this gamble. It's either great or bad. And like, you just mm. have to, the, the narrative will be set almost immediately with a series. There's all this, like, I don't know. There's just something about the momentum of a series that seems to be carrying, carrying the day for different franchises these days for whatever reason. Yeah. You mostly took the words out of my mouth. I think that creators see this as a chance almost to redo some of these things in a more mm. intentional way. Streaming money is really good, and these shows look really good, and I honestly can respect that. Uh, you bring up Rings of Power, that's actually, to in my opinion, really different, because it's not just rehashing the Lord of the Rings like they say they're going to do in the future. But That's fair, that's fair. I mean, I get it. I I've watched the Twilight movies when they were on Netflix, I was like, you know what, I'm just going to do this. They could be redone, and it would be fine. <laughs> and so, I'm okay with it in general. Mm. This must just be what happens when you get older is they just like take all the things that you watched when you were growing up and they're like new actors, new, new series, like just throw out the old and in with the new. And I'm getting deja vu because I feel like we have this conversation every week, like <laughs> we're talking about a reboot of Lord of the Rings. We're talking about a reboot of Harry Potter. Now we're talking about a reboot of Twilight. Like, I don't know, man, let's, let's explore these worlds a little bit more. Like yeah. why the rush to get, I mean, I know the rush. It, it's because it's, it can be a tent pole for your streaming service or whatever, and it can make a lot of money and, and it will, uh, it just comes down to that. It's, these are money generating properties or money generating moves. But like you said, Jay Scotty, I'm with you. Like, I want to see some new stuff. I'm, I'm tired. I'm, uh, I'm tired of reboots. Like let's, uh, yeah. let's, let's get down the road with something new or let's come up with something new. I can't remember if it's the case but are we certain that this version of twilight is a reboot it so it wasn't like official official but it seemed that way like the way that it was it was weird like the way yeah. it was reported as news was just like a twilight series is in development type thing yeah. but it did kind of come off like we're just starting over it did mention that stephanie myers was involved uh, with the series, and I'm one, and that, that could just mean she's there to like make sure they stay true to her original vision. Mm. But uh, another take is, who knows? Maybe they are like picking up the story t 15 years later, and it's like a rap about what is it? Resme was that the name of the baby? Renesme. Renesme. Thank you. Thank <laughs> it's you. It's weird that I know um, that, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, well, it's you're, you're a smart one, Haley. You remember things. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know how substantial the claims are, but what I remember reading or hearing is that it's going to be like the Harry Potter series and that each book is going to get its own season this go around. Mm. So I do think it's a rehashing or redo or reboot or reimagining. Are there any other words <laughs> that I can add re to? I think mm. book purists will like that though. You always hear about the book versus the movie, book versus the movie. Sure. And this is a way to really adapt literature in a way that hopefully will make fans happy, but who knows? Mm. That's that's unlikely. It's unlikely. Fans are never happy. That's what you have to start with. You have to understand always that that is the baseline. Right. Is unhappy. We're going in this with optimism, Jay, <laughs> <laughs> and a plucky attitude. <laughs> All right, our last uh, our last main story here we have is 
Over in the casting rumor mill, uh, multiple industry insiders have broadcasted scoops that Adam Driver is in final talks to portray the Fantastic Four patriarch, Reed Richards, in the MCU. Do we think there is legitimacy to these claims, and if so, is Driver the right man to lead Marvel's first family, or is it too much of a stretch? Oh, snap. <laughs> That's funny. Um, uh, I'm so I'm so torn on this news. If it's real, Driver is known for being broody in his roles, and he's he's known for being kind of the the dark feature, dark actor. And maybe he wants to get away from that, and maybe it would be really fun to see him in a lighter, more comedic role. But as Reed Richards, I just don't know if I see it. However, I don't know if I can see anybody other than John Krasinski as Reed Richards. Anyway. Mm. It's fair. Adam Driver must want that money because after Star Wars, he seemed like he was so done with the idea of a franchise. Mm -hmm. Like he was done, done. And th just, I mean, an interview said as much. And so to to come running back to another franchise and be the tentpole of a franchise mm -hmm. seems like a left turn a little bit. You know, I like Adam Driver. I don't know if I'm crazy about him in this role. Um, I heard other casting rumors. There were other guys involved, like um, Diego Luna was thrown around. Penn Badgley from You was thrown around. I think I, I don't know. I might, I might like a couple of those guys a little bit better in that role. But at the end of the day, I mean, you know, it's. I think he can do it. I just, like you said, Haley, I, it's it, it's hard for me to picture him in that sort of uh, role in that sort of kind of um, character. I guess. Mm. Hmm. Interesting takes. Like, yeah. Adam Driver was not on my bingo card for potential Reed Richards casting, but now that I, I hear it and I imagine it, I love it. I, I think it works really well. Like, I agree with you, Haley. Like, John Krasinski would have been my first choice, but I kind of let that go once we got him in Multiverse of Madness. I, I think, Matt, you even said on the MCU cast, like, now that they've given that to us, it was so demanded now that they've given it to us. It's probably not very likely that we're going to get him going forward, but just... Looking at like the roles uh, Adam Driver has picked in the past and his body of work, like I think he actually fits into a very similar role that John Krasinski has kind of transitioned to from his uh, days on on the office. Like he's he's a very capable leading man, um, has a strong presence, has a fatherly presence, and I think Adam Driver has a lot of those same qualities. So I I absolutely mm. would love to see him in the role. Something that uh, I'm, I'm I'm muddled on who said it. Uh, somebody like. Uh, Said, uh, I think it was you, uh, you Haley, uh, said the idea that like he's kind of a dark character offer, dark and brooding. And y you think of Reed Richards as kind of funny, uh, or, or like that's a strange choice. I think because Krasinski would have been a funny Reed Richards, would have been like funny, quippy, uh, light Reed Richards. But maybe they're going, if this is the casting choice, if this is true, maybe it's more of a clue as to what Reed Richards they're trying to give us. Like, because Reed Richards in comics also has some pretty dark things that he does. He has that Tony Stark, like duality of like, I'm a hero, but I also struggle with being like too powerful and like wa power hungry. And like, maybe they're going for a more complex, darker Reed Richards, which I don't know. I could, I could definitely see that being interesting. I'm also just kind of like, bring me some unknowns again, Marvel. Like, sure. I, I want to yeah. see some people I don't know. For sure. For sure. Okay. Real quick, let's check in on our poll from last week. We asked you guys, which announced show are you most excited for? And with 50% of the vote, and it's a big deal because there were five, six options, uh, <laughs> you guys chose The Penguin as the series you're most excited for. Uh, won by a landslide, and right behind it we had uh, the Game of Thrones prequel and the Conjuring series. Uh, what do you guys think of the poll from last week? Sounds like our listeners are right in lockstep with us because we were pumped about the Penguin series <laughs> yep. last week. I completely agree. I think uh, <laughs> we definitely we definitely feel like they feel. Um, that's cool. And lastly, we're going to do our lightning round, and we're going to do it as quick as we can. Uh, and the way we do that, you have to say your name to buzz in, and only one person gets to respond to each story. Uh, and throughout this entire lightning round, you get one response to a response. All right. Here we go. Lightning round. The Craven the Hunter spinoff from Sony starring Aaron Taylor Johnson is officially confirmed to be rated R. Scotty. Ooh. Yeah, I'm like thinking to Sony right now, just when I didn't think you could do anything more stupid, 
<laughs> or like anything to make me less interested in this series, you go and do a 180 because my interest level goes from nothing to, okay, you've got my attention and curiosity. I'm still very, very skeptical about this series. And I think Craven is an odd choice for the first R-rated outing, especially when we had Venom and a Venom sequel come out with Carnage but of all characters. But uh, I do think Aaron Taylor Johnson is a really good actor and the fact that it's it's leaning into this um, this kind of gory approach has me, you know, like I said, from not interested at all to at least skeptically interested. So <laughs> good on you. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Two writers will write the 11th and final installment in the Fast and the Furious saga. Christina Hodson, who wrote Bumblebee and the Flash, and Oren Ozeal, who wrote The Cloverfield Paradox and Mortal Kombat. Matt, uh, I would like to respond to this because I think it's hilarious that they have chosen two writers who have written such outlandish stuff <laughs> to write the final... Like, I feel, when I read that they're like The Flash and Cloverfield Project, I was like, they're going to definitely take them like multiversal, right? Like, they've already gone to space. Like, what's next? What's next for The Fast and the Furious? And I'm thinking multiverse or, you know, something to that nature. <laughs> next, we have Juno Temple, who plays Keeley on Ted Lasso, is in final talks to lead Venom 3 with Tom Hardy. Jay. Uh, Venom 3, like, they have got to be kicking themselves after seeing this announcement about Craven. They're like, wait, we didn't know you guys were going to do it or we would have done it type thing. Like, so what is going to happen with this movie? I mean, um, I, I like Judo Temple. Uh, Ted Lasso is awesome. Like, anybody in that show can be in anything. But, you know, I haven't been crazy about the Venom movies, so we'll see. But, uh, you know, I think uh, this seems like a franchise that might be wandering a little bit uh, with all the all the with the Spider-Man connection and the Sony connection and kind of being everywhere in between. Mm. All right. Uh, Adult Swim announces a 10 episode Rick and Morty anime spinoff, which will premiere on Max later this year. Scotty. Oh, 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 geez, Rick. Uh, why, why do we have to get a? Why do we have to get an anime series, Rick? Who asked for this, Rick? Uh, but, no, uh, you know, problematic uh, creatives have been kind of a theme of this episode, and I, I do, um, you know, in a world post the uh, accusations against Justin Roiland and his eventual exoneration, like I'm, I'm surprised there hasn't been as much of a conversation there. But I have been wondering what's going to happen to Rick and Morty like going forward and all of the other animated uh, projects he was working on. But I did check out the two shorts that came um, from the, the new showrunner here. I believe his name is Takashi Sano. He did two shorts that kind of gave him carte blanche to develop this anime series. And I will say um, it looks pretty interesting. I think it is taking the best of anime and those tropes there and combining it with what people really like about Rick and Morty in terms of the sci-fi meta crude tongue-in-cheek approach so um i'll be i'll be interested to see what this series pans out to be mm. matt for a response uh i what uh <laughs> <laughs> what, it's so we t we've been sitting here talking about all, all these shows that like com are doing like reimaginings reboots like this show is still a fairly new show. It's like it's fourth season and they're doing a reimagining in a different style that is not connected. I, mean, I think it's multiversally connected, but it's mm -hmm. not connected to the original show. It's like they're, it, it's like they're doing the thing that Jay was talking about earlier, like ruining your childhood or whatever. But like <laughs> they're doing it while those kids are seven still. Like, I don't know. They're not people. Please don't watch this if you're seven. Um, anyway, please I was <laughs> I was just saying. Like, yeah, you, you hear what I'm saying? It's just it's very strange. It's very very strange. Mm -hmm. Okay, up next, Disney and Victoria Alonso have officially settled out of court for an undisclosed amount. The former Marvel executive and head of VFX was fired by Disney last month in a messy public split. Haley, uh, I'd say that Victoria Alonso has been really classy about this whole thing. She just recently got back on her Instagram posting totally unrelated stuff. Um, and so good for her that they just settled out of court and it's over. And, you know, I think we'll miss her touch, but... Uh, we'll see what they do moving forward. Sweet. 
Okay, next story. So many lightning rounds this week, guys. Peaky Blinders creator Stephen Knight is in very early development of a drama series based on the life of William Shakespeare. Haley, Haley? hosts a Haley hosts a book podcast. She should be the one to respond <laughs> I was to this. Say, uh, <laughs> cool, I'm super Jay, into that. Actually, Jay buzzes in I, for I Haley. kind of glossed over that. <laughs> um, I that's like a surprise lightning one. That's cool. Uh, we you know we wanted original content. We were just saying earlier this is what we're kind of craving with all these reboots, reshoots, whatever. This sounds a little more original. We haven't had some good Shakespeare content since flipping what was it called Shakespeare in Love with mm. uh, Gwyneth Paltrow. Um, so <laughs> cool. Bring it on. I'm going to use my response to say, I thought you were going to say something like, we haven't had any Shakespeare content since the Renaissance or something like that. <laughs> oh, I'm not that quick, Jay. <laughs> and I used it for that. Now I can't even use it for anything else. So, <laughs> All right. Up next, a documentary about Alec Baldwin and the accidental shooting incident last year is underway as Rust resumes production. Matt, Scotty. Go for it. Oh, oh, yep. You go for it. I've already spoken once. No, I was just going to say this is like, you know, I don't want to make light of the absolute tragedy that was the accidental shooting of uh, Helena Hutchins, but it's just like, why are they even resuming production on Rust while there are people like walking around with cameras, like actively filming Alec Baldwin as he's like, you know, going from one place to another? Like, it's just, I would have abandoned that movie and just, you know, cut my losses and, and tried to move on. So. Um, it makes me interested to see how both are going to be received. Rust, when it finally does come out, and I w- would not be surprised at all if this documentary ends up getting more attention than the film itself. Mm. So true. All right. In an interview with Hollywood Reporter, actress Patti Lapone seemed to insinuate that the upcoming Marvel show Agatha Coven of Chaos is a musical or at the very least has some musical elements stating that not only is Catherine Hahn singing lead while other witches sing backup, but that the songs have been written by the same writers who created the song for Agatha all along for WandaVision. Haley, Patty Lapone, Broadway legend. For those young listeners who don't know who Patty Lapone is, you should look her up. She's super well known. She's a Tony Award winner. Very famous for her role in Evita. Also look that up. She said a lot of interesting <laughs> things in this article. Um, first, I'm going to talk about the Disneyfication of Broadway, which she brought up. And she has turned in like her actor's union um, card, whatever it's called. She only wants to do film. She doesn't want to go back to Broadway because she doesn't like what's happening. And I'm so on board with that. Well, Shrek the Musical was like the, the it for me. I'm so over this kind of movies and the musical thing. But that's besides the nerdy news point. We can go on about that later. WandaVision, the musical, basically, I'm super into this. Um, Catherine Hahn did her own singing on Agatha all along, if you didn't know. That's her on that track. And the Lopez Andersons, who have written the music for Frozen, also wrote all of the theme songs for WandaVision. So if they're back, I think they smashed it out of the park for that show, and I'm really looking forward to this. This could be Patti Lapone's interpretation of what the show's going to be. It could be this one scene that they filmed and she doesn't really know the scope of the show. We know that a lot of times some of these smaller characters in Mar- Marvel stuff don't really understand the full picture of what's going on. Mm. So it could be, it could not be. I'm super into it either way. Love it. Scotty. Not super lightning, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no. Scotty's got a response. Yeah, I was saving my rebuttal for this one. And yeah, I, this sounds... Amazing to me. And Haley, I appreciate the education on Patti Lapone. I was not familiar with her, but I definitely have some work to do in terms of checking out her body of work. But a musical sounds perfect for Agatha Coven of Chaos. Like the MCU has been known for doing some genre bending as it attempts to stay fresh. And one of the best things about WandaVision is that it was like an ode to TV of yesteryear. And I I think with musicals, there's an opportunity to explore that in the same way. Maybe we'll get some allusions to singing in the rain all the way to the more current stuff like Hamilton, maybe get some rap thrown, rap Mm -hmm. musical thrown in there. So um, I did want to highlight that Patti Lapone did this interview um, for the film Bo is Afraid and she's working with Ari Aster. So I had to skim through the article because I have not seen Bo is Afraid, but Ari Aster is one of my favorite directors working today. Mid- Midsommar and Hereditary are a couple of my favorite movies to come out in the last few years, and it seems like a renaissance for horror. So I, you know, 
had to uh, had to show some love there as the resident art art house horror fan. Mm. Awesome. Oh man, I think we're all out of responses. You guys get get ready on your buzzers. <laughs> In our Netflix corner to round out the show, uh, we have four quick stories. First, Netflix has released its first official trailer for season three of The Witcher. No Witcher fans. I played the game. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we got we got if we ever have a big Witcher story, we got to remember to get somebody on for that. Uh, <laughs> all right, Matt, I watched the trailer, <laughs> and it was it seemed cheesy to me, but I'm sure some of the things that happened were very meaningful to people who like the show. There's this weird moment where they all like <laughs> uh, everyone said names, and it was just like I don't know, Geralt, Siri. Like they, it, it's just like whispered names, like, and it was like we're gonna. It was, it was like they were. We're gonna feature all your favorite characters. I don't know, but uh, I'm sure <laughs> if you love those characters, that's very exciting. Um, <laughs> <you know. laughs> they released a trailer for Fubar, an action comedy led by Arnold Schwarzenegger about his character's life as a spy intersecting his life as a dad. Matt. I just this was one I had to say my name on because I I I will I love I'm excited about this. It looks good, but I'm mostly excited because I really want Jamie Lee Curtis to play his wife. Uh oh, because yes. this is true <laughs> lies, man. This looks like so much like true lies, which is one of my favorite like nineties Arnold Schwarzenegger movies, and it just looks a lot like that. The same vibe, family man, spy, uh, and how it all mixes together. I would love that. Oh, it looks great. All right, Netflix also announced The Burrows, a sci-fi series that will pro- be produced by Stranger Things creators, the Duffer Brothers. Jay, um, Stranger Things is getting ready to ramp up, and this show has, the, based on the description, kind of a similar vibe. It talks about kind of like unlikely heroes uh, a co- kind of uh, uniting to take on some sort of sci-fi threat or something like that. And so, I, I don't know. I think if you like Stranger Things, which I do, I think this seems like a natural kind of next thing to jump onto from the Duffer Brothers, who have proven that they can handle a franchise and grow it really effectively. Hmm. Absolutely agree. And finally, Netflix announced All the Light We Cannot See, limited series by Sean Levy, director of Stranger Things and Free Guy. Uh, It will star Mark Ruffalo and be based on the Pulitzer Prize winning novel. Am I the only person here who's read All the Light We Cannot See? Clearly. <laughs> All right. Well, if you uh, let me just uh, get in here for a second again. Uh, if uh, <laughs> if you have not read All the Light We Cannot See, uh, it is fantastic. I think it's going to ultimately end up being one of like the books from the 21st century. Like when we look back and we kind of talk about like what were the most impactful books written in the last hundred years, I think it'll be on that list. Uh, it is uh, a World War II book. I don't want to give too much away, but it deals with the perspectives of these two characters. Um, what makes the book so good are the descriptions in it. They're very powerful. And uh, that being translated to a show, I don't know how that's going to work because that's what really drew me into the book in the first place uh, was just the the way that the author describes things. One of the characters is blind. And so there's kind of like a trying to describe life through this character's eyes uh, is, is just masterfully done. Uh, and so I'm interested, but I'm also kind of like, how are they going to do that? Uh, just based on what made the book so appealing. Mm. But definitely one to put on your summer reading list. Just <laughs> added it to my to be red pile. <laughs> Thanks, Teach. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, uh, that's that sounds really good. Thanks, uh, thanks for in- educating us on it. The trailer looks great. Uh, let's. That is all for multiverse news, you guys. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and if you haven't yet, please give us a five star review on like iTunes and all those places because it really matters. And uh, new people finding the show, uh, it matters a lot. And uh, speaking of teach, uh, Jay Sisson, tell them where they can find you. <laughs> That's what you call a segue. Mm-hmm. To the next thing. <laughs> a segue with something else coming in the middle. It didn't work very well. Sorry. <laughs> I I am a co-host of Commute the Podcast. Uh, it's a weekly educational show where me and my co-host try to teach you three interesting things on your way to work. So we keep it about 20, 25 minutes, uh, quick and to the point. So uh, come hang out with us, learn something new. Uh, where are you? You know, on your way to get where you're going. Mm. Haley Hobbs, tell the people where they can find you. <laughs> 
Uh, I love Commute the Podcast, by the way. Everybody should listen to it. I am a co-host of Source Pages, the podcast. We read novels and comics as primers for the geeky TV shows and movies you love. We're deep in Guardians of the Galaxy right now, so check us out. And J. Scotty St. Clair. Yes, please find me over at Animation Deliberation. We are the podcast that takes action, animation, and cartoons seriously, but not too seriously. And I also want to mention, I spoke a lot on this, on this episode about wanting to see original, fresh content. You should also check us out over on PandaVision. We're talking about Barry Season 4, yeah. and that is definitely some fresh and original content that I'm enjoying talking about. That's what was going to be my yeah. plug, man. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Steven. He stole the plug. He stole my plug. Yeah. <laughs> c- c- watch Barry. That's my plug. Don't don't worry about our <laughs> podcast. No. Watch Barry. And, and and me and Jay Scotty have been talking about it every week over on Pandavision. Um, so it is a freaking great show and uh it's really good. So come join us on Pandavision. And uh we'll we'll be back here, multiverse news, next week with lots of stuff. This week was a crazy, crazy news week. It felt like there was nothing, and then there was everything um, all of a sudden, which that's good. It's good. I'm glad, we, I'm glad we got to talk about it all so quick. We'll be back soon. Peace. CinemaCon 2024 or bust. Yeah. <laughs> Get us there. Come on. You know you want to. <laughs> Somebody's listening. <laughs> <laughs>